got the yeah we've got a so then this mic Just at the time that you all probably thought that we were done with Zoom because lockdowns were over and school was back into the swing of things, some people came to you from the middle of nowhere United States on a national tour and they brought Zoom into the room. And so uh, here we are. And we're live on YouTube, I believe. So people on the YouTube side, go ahead and let us know if you can hear us, if everything's coming through clear on your side. Um, we never really know with the technical setup, but I think we're here. Yeah. So welcome. Um, I'm David McCarricker. I'm with Theory Underground. And we are on a national book tour for these two books. Mine, Time Energy, Why You Have No Time or Energy. It's an existential sort of analysis of uh, labor power in the 21st century. Uh, it is meant to pose a problem for all existing political movements, and I think it's an important idea. And so make sure to check this out. It's on the table. I'm not allowed to sell you this because something about this space, they say, don't sell anything. Um, so don't buy this, no matter what you do. We'll sell it to you later, off premises, yeah. And then the real book, uh, the one that has Chris Catrone in it, is right here. It's Underground Theory. Underground Theory has over 31 contributors, including some big names, such as Slavoj Žižek, Norman Finkelstein, Alenka Zupančić, Todd McGowan. Anybody familiar with any of these names? Some of you, a few of you. Um, and a lot of nobodies. And that's actually kind of the point. The point all along was that we had a bunch of nobodies. The Theory Underground is a platform for lecture courses and social media that is run by and for blue collar intellectuals, right? Um, when Slavoj Žižek heard we'd been defending one of his recent unpopular takes online uh, from the people who were critiquing him, that they weren't really critiquing him, they were just criticizing. Um, he donated something to our volume and we thought, you know what, let's, let's open it up. Let's bring a bunch of other people on so they don't think we're all just Žižikians, right? Um, we love Slavoj Žižek, but if you put Slavoj Žižek on there and then you have a bunch of nobodies, they're going to assume, well, it's just a bunch of Žižikians. And of course, people like Todd McGowan and Alenka Zupančić, they're, they're excited to be a part of this volume. But we're like, no, we need to get some other people in on this as well. And so we got people like Daniel Tut and Nina Power, two extremely far ends apart on the cultural, political spectrum in these sort of niche online spaces in which platypus is one of the dominant or, or uh, I, I don't know, entities, yeah? I mean, Darian's nodding his head. I mean, it's a big deal to us where we come from, but where we come from, Sublation Media, platypus, 
you're big on our radar. You really mean something to us. Um, you've platformed a lot of people, a lot of people we wouldn't know about if it wasn't for you. So thank you for that. Um, show of hands, how many of you are with Platypus? Oh my God, it's like almost half, yeah? And then uh, the, for the rest of you all, are you just kind of from, are you all from this school? Show of hands for people from the school. Most of you. And then anybody not from here who just came because of a poster or the online events? Awesome, awesome. Well, this is so far our best turnout on this tour. We've, we wanted to see what we could do with, with basically throwing this thing together very last minute. Um, Anne and I just got married like a month and a half ago, I think. Um, the, oh, 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 thank you. Oh my God, I'll oh, stop. Oh, stop it. Um, I wasn't looking for that, I promise. But of course, everyone who gets married is looking for a little like confirmation, you know, that everyone else recognizes that we're a cute couple, you know. Um, but no, the, the only reason I bring this up is because I was organizing this conference, this distributed conference slash book tour, like what, two, three, four months ago? I mean, really, with a handful of people, but slowly more and more people started saying, oh yeah, come to my city, we can make something happen. And so uh, then we went away for the marriage thing and the honeymoon thing, and we were kind of off the radar for a couple weeks, and then we came back and it was like, oh, we're about to go on tour, and oh, we've got all these extra stops, and oh, we're not gonna be able to do this in the two and a half months that we had originally planned, and oh, now we have to do it in one month. And so Chris was just saying that we've set ourselves up for a punishing tour. And I like the terminology because we've done nearly 8,000 miles in the last three weeks. We've covered the distance from Boise, Idaho, uh, all the way to somewhere out in the middle of nowhere, Ontario, New York City, Washington, D.C., and now we're here. But there's a few other stops along the way, but that's kind of the big spots. And so uh, Slavoj Žižek was there for our launch. Um, Norman Finkelstein was there for our New York City side of the tour. Daniel Tutt was there in Washington, D.C. When we were in Ontario, we were with Andrew McLuhan, the grandson of Marshall McLuhan, the guy who famously said that the medium is the message. We get a lot of inspiration from McLuhan because I mean, we kind of live in his world. He was the guy who foresaw the internet 30 years ahead of his time. Um, and people argue whether he was too optimistic or too pessimistic. We're both. We're pretty optimistic and pessimistic at the same time because there's a lot of good things that come with these new means at our disposal. There's also a lot of bad things. And one of the bad things is our tendency to assume an audience already supposed to care, already supposed to know. Right? And so this assumption of an audience that has been prefigured by consumer demographics via the algorithms on the attention economy is something that we're trying to break out of. We're trying to learn how to speak to, I don't want to say normal people, I don't want to say, I don't want to say the regular working class because there's no such thing from, from our standpoint. There's only other people. And those people are never a clear one-to-one -one representation of the actual public. And the actual public, if it actually exists in our heads, doesn't really exist in the real world. As far as we can tell, we've got no access to it. If you've ever felt like you have access to it, maybe you're delusional or maybe you're privileged. We're not really sure, but we think that when you turn on your camera and you talk and you're using a bunch of words that a certain consumer demographic on the attention economy is using, that's not really the public, right? That's like going into Hot Topic to buy some, I don't know, some punk looking clothes and like some band t-shirt and then you get up and say by the way everybody and then you say something and you're like yeah I said my piece it got out there it reached the world it reached the public and it's like no it didn't it hasn't and so underground theory is this idea uh, that we have that what is existing online right now on left tube and theory gram and or BreadTube, any of these parts of the internet where there is an interest in left-ish or theory-related, philosophy-related content, that this is a part of a scene. And it's a part of a scene in the same way that punk was, in the same way that hardcore was, in the same way that um, blues was, jazz was. These are scenes. These are 
aesthetic phenomenon. And that's not necessarily bad, but it's also not what you're looking for, I'm assuming. I'm assuming that if you're involved with platypus or if you're even coming for this, and you're probably hoping for something a bit more. You're probably hoping that this scene gives birth to a movement. And it is our assumption that there needs to be a space for people to enter critical dialogue, a, a period of moratorium, suspending your presuppositions, working through contradictions, and uh, that it's from that kind of a sustained dialogue and discourse that an intellectual milieu arises. And that an intellectual milieu that is trying its best not just to be in serious conversation with other people, but also tracking with the world itself, trying to understand the world, that, th that that's the prerequisite for any kind of a genuine movement to unfold, right? I think Platypus gets that. I think Platypus has been doing this a lot longer than we have. Um, and so there is some synchronicity or some overlap in terms of some of our goals, some of our interests, but then there's also differences. And Platypus has always been really good about platforming differences, about allowing a plurality of perspectives to clash and to let those, con those contradictions um, see the light of day. Because we live in a world today where people don't want that. That messes up the algorithmically siloed uh, spaces that serve influencers and their followings, but doesn't actually serve some kind of a discourse the kind of dialectical discourse that we, we hope to see here tonight. And so, with all of that said, underground theory is not the same thing as theory underground. Theory underground is a, a course-gated or course-centered philosophy and theory website. It's, a, it's also a social media site. It's also an app. You can go to the iOS or Android stores and actually download the app for free. Um, I spent the last six months trying to get that set up. And what I think I'm doing as a solo educator who wanted to be a professor, but also saw that none of the professors that I was in dialogue with were actually happy or didn't really, I, I couldn't really imagine most of the professors I looked up to going that route if they were in my position now, right? With tenure so far away, with uh, funding and, uh, going down and, and the fact that so many of the professors that I know have to teach the same courses over and over and over and over again and they don't get the time or energy to research the things that they want to research and or teach and that the students most of the students in their classrooms have their earbuds in don't really care about the subject matter and it gets frustrating and of course there needs to be a space for that but also what about the students what about the people who want to study these things who don't get into these universities? What about the people who are through the podcast world or through, the, through something like YouTube or Twitch coming into this stuff as workers with earbuds? What about them? And my hypothesis or assumption is that there's more interest than we think because of the internet but people don't just want to get this stuff secondhand. People actually want to dive into it themselves. They don't just want takes produced by other people as representatives or influencers. They actually want to crack into the books for themselves. And so the idea with Theory Underground is to make a space for underground theory to unfold. I mean, it's unfolding anyway, but we want to do it in a more deliberate manner. And so with that said, we're going to hear from Darius, who is one of the, one of the key one of the instrumental organizers here at Platypus. Um, and so if you'd come up here, say a few words about things that Platypus is doing, things that people can get involved with, and then introduce Chris, who is our keynote speaker. Um, then myself, Anne, and Nance will give our presentations. Ours will not be very long, but the goal, the goal of this whole thing is that the keynote and the locals get to meet us because we're not just like, we're not student organizers. We are not part of some institution. We are just this thing, this weird entity that doesn't really have an adequate description yet, kind of like a platypus. So please put your hands together for uh, welcoming Darius. Hello, everybody. Hello, everybody online. Uh, my name is Darius. Thanks for the introduction, Dave. Um, so yeah, I. 
maybe you can start with how I came to join Platypus. I actually had heard about it in almost a subcultural way, almost in terms of a scene as you described, Dave. But I think uh, it quickly transcended that after I discovered it in real life uh, on the SAIC campus about two years ago. And I was initially a student of Chris's in an Adorno class and uh, you know, heard about it through there. Um, but I'd, I'd heard about it online previously in this kind of, uh, in this kind of fleeting way. Um, so after attending the reading group here at SAIC, uh, I discovered that it was actually different than just a subcultural um, or a, uh, <clears throat> different than just a, a, another scene like the punk or the hardcore scene. So that was exciting, um, and I've been attending ever since. Uh, this year, Omer and I have been co-pedagogues at the SAIC chapter of the reading group. Um, we meet on Tuesdays at uh, 6.15. And if you're interested in attending the downtown SAIC reading group, uh, please meet with me afterwards. Um, Platypus is, of course, an international organization with reading groups uh, across uh, the sea, as well as across America. So uh, we have mostly uh, campus-based reading groups who also organize public fora, um, meaning panels or teach-ins, as well as now multi-organizational events such as this one. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce Chris Catron. He is a founding member of Platypus, an educator here at SAIC in History and Critical Theory, and the author of the recent book, Death of the Millennial Left. One more thing I have to say is that if you're interested in attending a book talk by Chris, on October 6th, we'll be meeting right back here in this room at 4 p.m. Uh, to do a book talk and Q&A session about the death of the millennial left, and a teaser, perhaps, of the next volume in the series. So without further ado, welcome Chris Catron. All right. <clears throat> so I'm going to present the uh, article that is included in Underground Theory, and that's the negative dialectic of Marxism. So I originally wrote this for a Platypus annual international convention panel discussion in 2021 that featured um, Douglas Kellner, who is a longtime scholar of the Frankfurt School, um, Doug Lane, who's the publisher of Sublation, uh, formerly of Zero Books, and David Gramer, who was from the um, Association for the Design of History in Germany. Um, so that panel, like I said, took place a couple of years ago, but I included this paper uh, in the underground theory in part because uh, I thought that it was a nice way of um, summarizing in a short form my approach to Marxism and especially with respect to others in the volume like uh, Slavoj Zizek um, who have a, a kind of a different way of, of looking at these things. So without further ado, I'll, I'll do this paper. Um, so, I would like to address the reason why Marxism was and must be dialectical. To demystify this word and specify it and its necessity for Marxism. What is the necessity of the dialectic for Marxism? It is of an essentially negative character. For instance, all degeneration of Marxism can be called undialectical the abandonment of this essentially negative and dialectical character. The Frankfurt School thinker Theodore Adorno um, titled his last completed book, Negative Dialectic, and he thus sought to recapture this original sense of Marxism, which had been progressively abandoned in Adorno's lifetime in the 20th century. Moreover, as Adorno emphasized, the task is to, quote, think dialectically and undialectically at the same time, because getting beyond capitalism would mean getting beyond the dialectic. Or, as Adorno wrote, quote, no longer a totality nor a contradiction. Looking back upon the history of Marxism, 
There are three different moments for considering this problem. Marx's own formative moment of Marxism, that's one. The second being the height of Marxism as a political force in the world in the time of Lenin. And then finally, the third period, the degeneration of Marxism into what Adorno called dogmatization and thought taboos. Our own moment today is the product of a century of such degeneration. <clears throat> By contrast, for Marx in his own time, the necessity of the dialectic was to be found in the self-contradictory character of not only capitalism, but of the struggle to overcome it in socialism. Marxism has its origins in the dialectical critique of capitalism, which also includes, at its core, the dialectical critique of socialism. It is significant that Marx and Engels began with the dialectical critique of the socialists and communists of their time, of the young Hegelians and others such as Proudhon, the founder of anarchism. In the subsequent height of Marxism as a political force during Lenin's time, the proletarian socialist movement and its organized parties became self-contradictory, subject to a dialectic. For instance, as Rosa Luxemburg critiqued the reformist revisionism in Marxism, there was a contradiction between the movement and its goal. Um, or we could put that as between means and ends, which also involved a contradiction between practice and theory. Lenin went so far as to say that this contradiction, this division and split within the workers' movement for socialism was what made political and social revolution possible and necessary. How was this so? First, it is necessary to address how Marx and Marxism understood capitalism as a problem to be overcome. What kind of society is capitalism from a Marxist perspective? Marx defined capitalism as a mode of production as a contradiction between the bourgeois social relations and the industrial forces of production. This is the essential character of the dialectic for Marxism, from which several other contradictions can be derived. For instance, the contradiction between the bourgeois ideological superstructure of false consciousness and the socioeconomic base. There, Marx defined the contradiction as temporal and historical in nature, the ideological superstructure changes more slowly than the socioeconomic base. Bourgeois consciousness is of a historical and not class character in a sociological sense of a particular group of people. Bourgeois means urban in the original French, and workers as well as capitalists are bourgeois in the sense of not members of the traditional rural classes or castes, of the preceding agricultural civilization. Peasants, manorial lords, parsons of the parish church, guild craftsmen of the village, and traveling merchant traders serving the Lord, etc. The new situation of society in the bourgeois epoch brought with it new forms of self-understanding that are well established and continue in capitalism, especially the autonomous individual as a social subject of production and exchange. Another way of describing capitalism is the contradiction between social being and consciousness. For Marxism, this contradiction of capitalism began with the Industrial Revolution. The consciousness of participation in society, in practice and theory, is bourgeois, while its actual social being has become industrial. The most important bourgeois ideology for Marxism is the consciousness of the workers as subjects of bourgeois society. The proletariat is a peculiar term referring to how the working class retained its formal rights as bourgeois citizens while substantially becoming expropriated of its property in its labor as a commodity, harking back to the ancient Roman class of proletari citizens without property. The Marxist critique of bourgeois consciousness as ideology is in its self-contradictory character. Hence, what distinguishes the Marxist dialectic is its critical character, from which it is distinguished, from example, from, for example, from the Hegelian dialectic, which is a description of bourgeois emancipation of free labor from slavery and caste constraint, the bourgeois revolution, became an affirmative dialectic 
unable to address the problem of capitalism after the Industrial Revolution. So the critical theory of Marxist politics, rather than any assumed politics of critical theory, is essentially its negative character, the self-negation of bourgeois society in the Industrial Revolution, in which, for example, bourgeois right became self-contradictory, self-undermining, and self-destructive in capitalism. It is important that most avowed Marxists today adopt Marxism in a false way, as a positive theory, a theory of what capitalism is. For example, rather than as Marx and the original Marxists approached capitalism, which was as a contradiction and crisis of society, a contradiction of its self-understanding and self-consciousness. I mentioned, for instance, social being and consciousness. For Marxism, social being does not define consciousness in theory and practice, but rather consciousness or bourgeois ideology or false consciousness is contradicted by the social being of industrial production and capitalism. The temporal and historical character of this is crucially important and usually neglected. From a Marxist perspective, bourgeois society was not capitalist, not self-contradictory from the beginning namely in the Renaissance and the subsequent 16th, 17th, and 18th centuries, but rather became so only in the 19th century, after the Industrial Revolution, in Marx's own time. This means an essentially negative approach to history in capitalism. History in capitalism, for Marxism, does not unfold positively, as with Hegel, as the development of consciousness, of freedom, but rather, but rather negatively, a broadening and deepening crisis of society, born of the essential contradiction of industrial forces of production against the bourgeois social relations. Capitalism is not a form of society for Marxism, but rather a self-contradiction and crisis of society, of bourgeois society specifically. The history of capitalism was for Marxism that of the unfolding task of socialism, but for the last hundred years, the task of socialism was abandoned in favor of the mere denunciation of capitalism, which was thus accepted as a positive fact rather than regarded properly as a negative task, something to be overcome. Involved in this was a collapse of the original distinction Marxism made between bourgeois society and capitalism, an elision of the contradiction between industrial forces and bourgeois social relations of production. The bourgeois social relations for Marxism are those of labor, cooperative social production. As Marx early on described about alienation, that is, the self-estrangement of social relations in capitalism, social relations are not only between people in society, but also between humanity and nature and includes our relations with ourselves. Marx added to this threefold character of bourgeois social relations a fourth dimension of alienation in capitalism, namely the estrangement of labor from capital as its product. So for Marxism, social relations in capitalism are phenomena of contradiction and crisis, and no longer primarily the constitutive dimension of society, as they had been in bourgeois consciousness. For instance, for Locke, or Rousseau, or Adam Smith, or Kant, or Hegel, and others. For Marxism, capitalism is not really a mode of production, but the self-contradiction of the bourgeois mode of production, that is, of the cooperative social production through the social relations of labor as a commodity. Marx defined bourgeois society as commodity-producing society, a society of commodities that produce other commodities. Labor, and later in manufacture and industry, labor power and labor time, as a commodity, produces other commodities. But in the Industrial Revolution, labor, including labor power and labor time, as a commodity, becomes divided against itself. It produces two opposed commodities, use values whose consumption reproduces labor in society, and capital as the objectification and alienation and self-estrangement of the social value of labor which ends up contradicting and undermining the basis for the reproduction of labor in society, the social relations of cooperative production. Capital investment becomes divided between human labor and scientific technique in production. Marx called science and technology the general social intellect. 
which mediated social production in a fundamentally different way from that of individual human labor. Social cooperation in capitalism was mediated by capital, hence capitalism. And for Marxism, as a form of Hegelianism, what mediates is also what embodies contradiction. What mediates also contradicts. So capital contradicts social cooperation, but also social cooperation, the bourgeois social relations of labor as a commodity, contradicts capital. Hence the class struggle of the workers as subjects of social cooperation versus the capitalists as stewards of the social value of accumulated labor in capital. Labor and capital confront each other as aspects of social contradiction. Capital is the self-contradiction of labor, and labor is the self-contradiction of capital in industrial production. The workers' demand for the value of their labor in capitalism is historically regressive in that it seeks to restore the value of labor as a commodity that industrial production has contradicted and undermined. However, although the workers demand the reconstitution of the social value of labor as a commodity, and thus the reconstitution of bourgeois society, this is also the inevitable form in which the demand for socialism will be manifested. Socialism will inevitably be posed as the restoration of society in bourgeois terms, that is, in terms of the social relations of labor. This means that the workers' struggle for socialism is inherently self-contradictory. It is divided and indeed torn between the contradictory impulses to restore and reconstitute labor as well as to transcend labor as a social relation and value. In the crisis of Marxism itself that came at the end of the First World War, as the cataclysmic culmination of the Second Industrial Revolution, there was a division between the old socialist and new communist parties over the issue of whether and how to save society from the devastation of war and political and social collapse and to revolutionize it beyond capitalism. There was an actual civil war within Marxism in the revolution that unfolded between 1917 and 1919. One side defended the working class as it existed in capitalism, while the other side sought to overcome it. Socialism itself became divided between the interests of the workers. The anti-communists considered revolution to be a threat above all to the working class itself. The socialist political party that had been built up to overcome capitalism became its last bulwark of defense. The power to overthrow and smash the capitalist state proved to be the power to save it. And both sides claimed not only to represent the true interests of the working class, but the ultimate goal of socialism itself. Both had right on their side, at least apparently. This was the most powerful demonstration of the dialectic ever in world history. And that is entirely appropriate since the Marxist dialectic was designed to address precisely this problem, as it had first manifested in the workers' movement for socialism in the 1840s and the revolutions of 1848, repeating itself on a higher level and in more drastic and dramatic and violent form in the revolutions of 1917 to 1919. And the division of Marxism between the parties of the old socialist second and new communist third internationals. But this political conflict within, Marxist, within the Marxist-led workers' movement was not a de novo phenomenon, but had long historical roots, which pointed to the development of contradictions within Marxism itself. This demanded a dialectical critique, a Marxist critique of Marxism itself. Just as Marx had engaged in the dialectical critique of the socialism and communism of his time, so Lenin, Rosa Luxemburg, and other radical revolutionaries in the Second International engaged in the dialectical critique of their own Marxist socialist movement. Later, Trotsky engaged in the dialectical critique of Stalinism. In subsequent history, successive generations, rediscovery of Marxism was the rediscovery of the dialectic, which however proved ephemeral and elusive and fragile as a red thread that has been lost and broken many times. This tradition of negative dialectical critique was carried on by the Frankfurt School under the rubric of critical theory. As I already mentioned, including Adorno's magnum opus, Negative Dialectic, but also Horkheimer and Adorno's Dialectic of Enlightenment. But the dialectic fell out of style in the 20th century, with Marxism itself rendered undialectical and discontents with the failure of Marxism, blaming the dialectic for the impasse of Marxism. 
Undialectical Marxists made explicit return to pre-critical, indeed pre-Socratic, philosophy, such as Althusser and his followers. Postmodernists such as Foucault rejected the grand narrative of history as the struggle for freedom. Unable to grasp the nature and character of the dialectic at a standstill in capitalism as the crossroads of socialism and, or barbarism, the domination of the contradiction of capital was blamed on the dialectic and often on Marxism itself. And yet the ironies of the Hegelian cunning ruse of reason were hard to shake off entirely, leaving the lingering question of meaning at the supposed end of history. This is the most difficult aspect of Marxism, but also the most essential. It is the most esoteric, but also the substantial core of Marxism. It is the most enchanting, but also the most frustrating quality of Marxism. It will inevitably return as Marxism continues to haunt the world of capitalism and its manifest contradictions. But can it be sustained? Will the capitalist world be brought back to the port of it to the point of its dialectical contradiction that points beyond itself. If so, then the necessity of the Marxist negative dialectic will be felt again and anew. On the Zoom side there, someone, oh, Sean, can you hear me? We were, oh, Chris sat down. Well, we can take a couple questions. We've got time. So if you're on the Zoom side, if you're on the YouTube Live side, if you're here in the IRL side, then yeah, you, we've got time for a couple questions. Just raise your hand if you're here or there or wherever. Um, if you're on the Zoom side, go ahead and turn your camera on if you are able to, assuming you're clothed. We had a someone who's practically naked turn on their camera when we were at the place in DC. All right, here we go. It's more of a, clar is, it, is this working? Okay. Ah, okay, it's more of a clarificatory question. Uh -huh. uh, can you say more of what you mean uh, when you say false consciousness? False consciousness, that's a good one. All right, so you know we have all these crazy catchphrases from Marxism that terrify us. So here's a clarification on false consciousness that will not clarify anything at all. So false consciousness is false because it's true. Okay, so what does that mean? Um, this is Hegel. This is straight up Hegel, which Schopenhauer regarded as sophistry and nonsense. So we have to grant that. But what it means is, false means self-contradictory. That's what it means. So the truth of false consciousness is that its falsehood points beyond itself. In other words, it's not simply wrong or a dead end it's not simply bad, but one has to understand the contradiction between thought and reality, but also the contradiction within thought itself and the contradiction within reality itself. So the path to truth is through the false, which nonetheless appears to be true, right? So in other words, false consciousness is basically everything that we take to be, that we assume to be true. And the only reason why it's false is that it leads us to believe that this is the way things have to be, right? So we take the true image of the world and we say to ourselves, this is the way it is. And the falseness of that is how that projects and assumes that it's the way it must be. Also, the way it's always been, right? So we assume the way things are now in some essential way that it's always been this way. And we assume it always will be this way. So again, the falseness of the true consciousness is that it hypothesizes the present, right? It basically says the way things necessarily are now, the necessity with which the world exists as it is, is a transhistorical necessity. It was always the case and it will always be the case. Tricky, right? But, but nonetheless, I guess one can make some sense of it. Yeah, so I think that most people when they hear false consciousness, well, they think two things. One is like, it's like commodity fetishism. People like to go shopping instead of doing the class struggle. Well, who wouldn't want to do shopping instead of the class struggle? The class struggle is like hard and it's violent and bloody and, and has no guaranteed good outcome. Buying commodities is satisfying and relatively unproblematic, right? You get what you pay for. 
Class struggle, not so much, <laughs> right? That's what they think commodity fetishism is. That's not what commodity fetishism is. They similarly think false consciousness is that the rich people pull the wool over our eyes and get us to see things from their perspective, that we're all gonna be Donald Trump someday. I don't think anybody really believes that. I mean, I don't know. Maybe some petty bourgeois think that, but I don't think any working class person believes that they're actually gonna be billionaires someday, no. So that's the other problem that we have is that too many people who have taken up Marxism are basically want to be ruling class people. We'll talk about this though, right? Um, and so again, the false consciousness is the ethics of labor, the work ethic, right? That you, know, you can have a dignified existence and you know, maybe things won't be great for you, but you at least understand the meaning of your life through like doing a good job, being a responsible member of society, contributing, participating. Um, and that would be a kind of you know, false consciousness in the sense that of course capitalism doesn't reward hard work. It's not possible for it to reward hard work, not because the capitalists are exploiting us, but because industrial production means that we're gonna be subject to unemployment, we're perfectly good laborers, but capital won't have any use for us. Right, so it's a more complicated question. But yeah, usually false consciousness is taken in these kind of mistaken ways of wrongheadedness or someone else's perspective that has like colonized your perspective. No, it's neither of those things. The actual consciousness of actual workers is true. It's false because it assumes that the world has to stay as it is. Darian has a question, and then we will, and then just so you know, don't worry, if you have a question a little bit later, there is going to be time to ask Chris again. You talked about the abandonment of dialectic and Marxism, and you mentioned Althusser. Mm -hmm. um, can you give some examples of that? I mean, it sounds like what you just said, like mm -hmm. wrongheadedness, for example, mm -hmm. might be an example of the mm -hmm. Marxist abandonment of dialectic. Right. But um, it, it, is that on the right track? And if not, what, you know, how, how, do we, right. how do we recognize that as well? Okay. Good. Um, so, yeah, Althusser is a, a kind of a tricky example because he's Lacanian, which I know Lacan is there in our underground theory. Um, so he has a different notion of, well, false consciousness um, and maybe the illusion of subjectivity, like this kind of thing. Um, so his conception was that there isn't like a contradiction, right? But the, and this is something that's very common now, multiple contradictions. And uh, so his essay that I think is most clarifying Althusser is called um, Contradiction and Overdetermination. And overdetermination is a psychoanalytic concept, right? So it's the idea that um, basically various different things in one's life history all combine, come together, and there isn't like a cause. So it's basically multiple, multiple causality. Um, and also historical events could be understood on analogy. So the idea is that the Russian Revolution, the Chinese Revolution, didn't have like a cause from a contradiction, but arose out of many causes, out of many contradictions. And again, we've taken this for granted in postmodernism, the kind of pluralization of things. Um, now, so the, the more you know, controversial aspect of Marxism as like a form of Hegelianism would be to say, no, it does boil down. All the different concrete mediations still do originate out of this core contradiction, right? Now, again, the disenchantment with that in the 20th century, why people gave up on that, was that it seemed to suggest a kind of linearity to history, right, a kind of uh, determined sort of historical necessity, um, which again was even understood as like a positive thing, like meaning like socialism or communism is this thing, it's one thing and we're, we have to be headed towards it and if we deviate from that, then, you know, we're abandoning the struggle for socialism. So what Althusser tried to introduce 
was the idea that there are many potential causes of you know, the struggle for socialism or communism. Um, and this was amenable to the new left because they liked uh, the plurality of social movements. And they had, of course, uh, become disenchanted with the workers' struggle for socialism because it seemed to have failed in, in any number of ways. Um, and so looking for like multiple agents, subjects, and also even to think of the individual as not a, a one subject, but many, like each of us are many different subjects, right? This kind of idea. Um, and, uh, you know, I can understand the attraction of that, but it does ultimately abandon the dialectic. And so even though Althusser was trying to rescue Marxism from a certain kind of Stalinist kind of historical determinism and a kind of linearity of history, what it actually gave rise to rather was postmodernism and you know what I would call the liquidation of the struggle for socialism into all sorts of capitalist political activities. Yeah. Cool. Excellent. Um, we didn't figure out the speaker order beforehand, so I'm just going to go and then, and then Nance and then Ann. This is so cool with the different mics. One of our big goals is to eventually have it so that it's one microphone, it goes through the system, and then that works also on the internet side. But there's too many systems, there's too many subjects, there's too many things. Um, so, underground theory. My uh, submission, my main submission in this work is called Lefter Than Thou Enjoyment. All right, um, and in it, I talk about the professional managerial class. I think it's real. I think it matters. If you don't, fuck you. No, I'm just kidding. Um, no, there's there's a, there's something to the idea that maybe the real issue with why we don't see revolution coming from the developed country has to do with something more like a labor aristocracy. All right, that's a very popular idea nowadays, especially with that book, Settlers that everybody in 2020 was saying, you gotta read it, you gotta read it, right? But the professional managerial class thesis, we think, is important. It's so important that at Theory Underground, the first course, well, actually the first course was the idea of university. The second course was on the professional managerial class consciousness and ideology, right? And so what we don't like about this term, and we'll explain what it is in a second for those who are like, what the fuck are you talking about? For, for those who don't like this term, we have to say we agree it's problematic and the way that people tend to use it, it's a problem. But that doesn't mean we throw it out in the same way that someone might misuse the term dialectic or someone might misuse the term Marxism. Just because someone, is, someone else is misusing the term or everyone else is misusing the, ter misusing the term doesn't necessarily mean we throw it out, right? And so the way that you see it getting used is as a slur as a way of dismissing people. It's almost a kind of reverse, a reverse identity politics. Now, I do think we need a, we need a reverse identity politics. Uh, but when it just becomes basic workerism, we have a problem with it. Um, and I say we in a very limited sense, meaning like myself and a handful of people, a very small constellation of people on the internet who are still working with this term. So what does it actually stand for? So most people, it means the professional managerial class, which also then gets kind of lumped up with the laptop class. That's something people say nowadays. Or the virtuals versus the physicals, meaning that there are people out here doing physical toil, making the world go round. They're productive. And then there are people who, if they're productive, it's kind of in this like weird abstract way. They're moving numbers around on computers and they, they don't ever really see or feel the direct consequences of their actions um, in the same way that a person who's, say, working on like irrigation in the city, if they fuck up, everyone's going to know about it, right? Um, and of course, with COVID, there, that became very popular to talk about the virtuals versus the physicals, right? The truck drivers with their convoy, like they are out there in the real world having to actually do stuff. And you got all these people who are using Zoom from home, and they're like, we don't see what the problem is, just stay home. Yeah, well, everyone else has to keep working, right? A lot of people say, well, everything changed after COVID, and everyone else 
is like, I didn't notice anything except that a handful of people that are like celebrities or whatever are now saying that we have so much in common, right? We don't actually have so much in common because we had to keep working, right? The professional managerial class becomes problematic, especially for Marxists because of this term class. How do we define class? Well, is it where your income comes from, your source of income? Does it have to do with the ownership of the means of production only? Or does it have to do with the control of the means of production, right? Barbara Ehrenreich, as well as James Burnham on the conservative side, he had been a Trotskyist, but he became a conservative, a neoconservative. Both of them kind of agree to a certain extent, and I kind of want to focus on the part where they agree, and that is to say, across the board, in the 20th, in the 20th century, a new class emerged. Now, it might not be a class. I'm open to bracketing that out. But there was a split between owners and controllers. And the controllers were these professionals and managers of capital. And so for people who say, well, controlling the means of production, that's not enough to actually count as a class. You have to also own those means of productions. Or if you don't own them, then you're just a part of the broader working class. Well. Maybe. I'm open to it. But I just bracket out the term class altogether and say the professionals and managers of capital. The professionals and managers of capital, PMC. I still get to retain the acronym. It's sublated. But now I don't care if it's a class. We could say it's an intermediary class. And obviously, there are intermediary groupings of people. It becomes problematic, though, when people use class instead of grouping. Right? W.E.B. Du Bois is a perfect example of somebody. He started talking about the black class. Right? If you read The Souls of Black Folk, he's talking about the black class. It's like, well, you're talking about a, a racial identity, you're talking about a sociological a grouping, but is it actually a class? Not in any kind of a Marxist sense. And though he became a socialist and actually a pretty strong supporter of the Soviet Union in his later life, in his earlier days, he was a progressive, a standard progressive. And what progressives were at the time, if anything, they were for class conciliation between the workers and the bosses. The PMC, from the beginning of the 20th century through the 30s especially, in this period of time, had to market itself, had to brand itself, had to sell itself to the capitalists as a solution that is more cost effective and ultimately wiser than sending the Pinkertons to break up a strike. Right? In the most brutal phase of capitalism, if the workers start organizing and making demands, you just send in your own private security force or militia, break some legs, kill a few people, you know? But it's cheaper, and ultimately, you can feel better about yourself if you replace that kind of intervention with something that preempts and undermines the conditions for being able to organize in the first place. And so you got to think, 1905, it's the rumbles of revolution coming across the ocean. People in the United States are taking note. Workers in Russia are fed up, right? It was around like 1905 uh, that a lot of people are getting activated or radicalized. I think that's around the time Lenin's brother tried to assassinate the Tsar and got offed. And uh, Lenin was like, oh shit, we're going to have to do better next time, 1917, right? The progressives in the United States at the time were like, we can't have that happen here. The capitalists obviously were like, I know, we know that. It ain't going to happen. And they were like, well, you can't just suppress it. What we can do if we're we can be a little bit more strategic. We can undermine it, we can preempt it through the schooling system. We can preempt it through tailorization. Now I know Chris has given a talk, or I don't know, I've heard, I haven't even seen it, but apparently you said that tailorization is good actually. And ultimately I think that we kind of agree on that hypothesis. There's nothing really wrong with tailorization per se, but if you read the principles of scientific management, by Frederick Winslow Taylor, 
then what you'll see is a perfect example of someone like W.E.B. Du Bois selling himself as necessary to the capitalist cause. Now, when I said this the other day, Daniel Tutt was like, you mean Booker T. Washington, right? Because generally we juxtapose Booker T. Washington to W.E.B. Du Bois, right? W.E.B. Du Bois being the more radical side, Booker T. Washington being not radical at all, right? He's just, Booker T. Washington is just like, hey, come to my school. I'll teach you all how to pull your bootstraps up on your own and start your own business and everything will be okay as long as you take on enough personal responsibility. Now, I don't want to completely throw him under the bus. The guy taught a lot of people how to read. That's very important. As Frederick Douglass said, reading was the first step of liberation for him as a former slave, right? He had to teach himself how to read as a slave. And so it's like admirable that Booker T. Washington was doing so much to help people become literate. W.E.B. Du Bois, though, was like, this is not sufficient. This is not going to cut it. We need something more. Um, but if you read the Talent to Tenth essay, which is in, I think, all newer editions of the Souls of Black Folk, he's basically saying, like, look, guys, uh, most of us aren't very smart. Most of us aren't even literate. Most of uh, people say that all the good things come from bottom up, but that's bullshit. This is basically what Du Bois is saying. He's saying, no, every race has its own top 10%, and every other race's top 10% gets together in like schools and stuff like that and makes themselves better, and then they go forth and then they educate and uplift the rest of the race, and that we need to do the same thing. Now, of course, we can be sympathetic. We understand, of course. Like, to some degree, there's something to that. Also, good things do come from bottom up. It's not everything good comes from top down. And it's specifically the paternalistic way that he is marketing his, he's, he's kind of saying, hey guys, we're the cool kids at the table here. We know what the 90% needs. All we need to do is develop ourselves and everyone else will get raised up, right? This kind of undermines that vision um, that had, uh, I guess, really flourished during the last 30 years of the previous century, all right? So between the 1870s and 90s especially is when the black farmers, millions of them, and white uh, miners joined forces in the Farmers Alliance, which eventually became the Populist Party. So before we ever had people like Laclau talking about populism, I still have no idea what Laclau actually has to do with populism. I don't think he understands what the word means at all. I don't understand why everybody, of Zizek and everyone affiliated with him, engages with Laclau when they talk about populism, but they don't ever engage with populism as an actual homegrown all-American idea, an ideal. And that ideal and that vision is of regular working class people being able to educate themselves and have, to some degree, local control. And I don't see any real contradiction with that and, say, Bolshevism, right? I don't see any real contradiction between um, that and any any kind of a movement that actually wants to succeed. Because when you've got a group of people making decisions for the entire rest of the country, and the rest of the country doesn't feel like they have any ability to actually reach you or talk back or say, hey, that's actually not going to work here for reasons that we all know about. There's a breakdown in communication. The, the populace doesn't feel represented, right? Will of the governed, kind of an important thing if you actually want long-term change to, to unfold. And so it is this period, though, between the 1870s and 90s um, and millions of people, black and white, saying, fuck the Democrats, fuck the Republicans, we want to do our own thing, that the Republicans and Democrats, mostly on the East Coast, started looking at each other and going, you know, I don't like you, but we have common cause, and it's against these plebs. It's against these farmers against these miners who don't appreciate us and who don't accept our paternalistic leadership. So W.E.B. Du Bois is in the context of that. 
but I don't know how much he knows that he's in the context of that because from his position, all he sees is, yeah, uh, the Civil War ended slavery, but now we're all sharecroppers. Racism seems to have only gotten worse, in fact. That's what he's concerned about, is the color line. And the color line, he says, is the most important thing, right? Now, we can all understand why he would say that, and it was at the time. But the reason that it was, was because Democrats and Republicans on both sides of the aisle had agreed to start rolling out systemic racism, to use the, the words we use in this day and age, which is to say laws that favored different people on the basis of their race and then excluded others systematically. These laws were being rolled out as a purpose, a purposeful or a deliberate is the word I'm looking for, a deliberate attempt to undermine class, working class cohesion and organizing. And it worked, right? When you, it's the same thing that happened after Bacon's Rebellion, saying, uh, hey, uh, we're going to change the game. Black and white people just work together in the working class. We can't have that happen again. And so what do they do? This is from the invention of the white, the invention of whiteness. I think that's the name of Theodore W. Allen's two-volume book. It's very important. But basically, after Bacon's Rebellion, this is, this is not uh, the 1416 project, the 1614. I don't know how to say it. 1619. This is not the 1619 project. right? This is like 50 years later. The idea was, oh, white people who are indentured servants can gain their freedom. Mulattoes, as they were called at the time, can also gain their freedom eventually. It's going to take longer than the white dudes. And then black people, they can no longer gain freedom ever. Right? The racialization of slavery comes out at that time. Right? And it's not something very many people were supportive of, but that it's something that people went along with. And it was very effective at undermining working class organizing. Right? Well, this thing that happened after the Civil War, with the betrayal of Reconstruction. That is something that's covered in uh, Dr. Adolph Reed Jr. and Kenneth Warren's book called <sighs> Renewing Black Intellectual History. I think that's the name of that book. Yeah, 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 yeah. And you can read his piece on this, um, The Color Line Then and Now. But I think the more important piece in there is by, I think her name is Judith Stein? Judith Stein, yeah. And she talks about the Farmers Alliance becoming populism, the Democrats and the Republicans on both sides rolling out racist laws to purposefully undermine this kind of organizing that they were seeing on the ground. All right? And so then you got W.E.B. Du Bois, you got Frederick Winslow Taylor. A decade later, you've got uh, Edward Bernays with his book Propaganda. And what they're all doing is the same. They're saying, hey, capitalists, you need me. You need me. I'm a professional. I can show you how to manage these people. I can show you how to make it so that the, the working class doesn't organize anymore. And they were organizing and they were in dialogue with people like the Rockefellers, people like the, the Carnegies. And uh, who's the guy? The president around the time. Um, Woodrow Wilson. I always forget it, so everybody who's on tour with me always remembers to say it. But Woodrow Wilson. I don't think he was president of the United States just yet at the time that he says this. And Anne might actually bring it up when she does her piece. So I'll just say it like, he basically comes out and says, look, we need two classes of people. There needs to be people who think, and there needs to be people who do. Because when workers are reading for themselves and they're having critical conversations and they're in dialogue, they become critical of us, and that's bad. And so we can undermine that through a public education regime that segregates people on the basis of artificial peer groups, right? Hyper niche identities will form within these peer groups when they are ranked against arbitrary standards that have absolutely nothing to do with their acquisition of genuine knowledge or a working understanding within the different fields that one actually has to understand really to be a free human being. Because the idea of the liberal arts is liberation. Liberation from preoccupation with toil, liberation from preoccupation with necessity, with necessary labor. Freedom means distance from that. And when workers get a taste of it, 
They want more, right? Nowadays, we just take it all for granted. You go through the schooling system, and how well you are doing determines whether you think of yourself as someone who's going to be able to make it as a professional or a manager, or someone who deserves to stay a mere worker, right? The schooling system itself teaches you, you, first of all, hate math, or you hate English. It teaches you that because you're being forced to memorize and regurgitate things. You're not being taught these things in a way that actually empowers you. It's teaching you your place, and it's helping individualize you, make you responsible to that. This is what I think of when I think of the PMC. But in my piece in Underground Theory, I say, aside from this little history lesson that I had to gain in trying to understand what was going on, there's something else going on, and I call it discursive Taylorism. I don't have a problem with Taylorism per se, which is to say the monopolization of skills in, uh, into certain roles that, are, that require a lot of expertise and specialization, and then the dumbing down of all the rest of labor to make every other laborer super replaceable. It's basically Taylorism. But discursive Taylorism goes a step further. We're not talking about engineers, like, yeah, do I want an engineer uh, who's got a lot of specialization in dialogue with other people in that field responsible for a bridge construction, or I want a bunch of nobodies doing democracy and saying how they want it built? Hell no. Obviously, we want specialists to build our bridges. Obviously, we need standards. A lot of the standards give rise to regulations. The regulations give rise to the certification programs. And at a certain point, it becomes a bunch of bullshit. But there's also a grain of truth here. And that is that in any possible future society that we can imagine, there's going to be people who are professionals and managers. There will be. So when people use, the P use oh, well, you're just a PMC as like a write-off. Oh, well, you went to college. You spend most of your time on laptops and reading books. You're a word person. Well, I'm a muscle person. I get work done by the sweat of my brow. Obviously, that's bullshit. Obviously, that's not what we're talking about. What we've got a problem with, though, is discursive Taylorism, which is the idea that there are domains of human knowledge that have nothing to do with bridges or trains running on time and have everything to do with social power. The humanities and social sciences are these domains. And when people make themselves spokespersons for these, in these domains and basically say, oh, well, you haven't gone to college and you didn't do good in school and you shouldn't be thinking about these things, you should just subscribe to me. Like, follow, subscribe. I'll be your influencer. And don't follow that other person. If you do, then you don't deserve anything. We have a problem with that. And that is kind of like this idea of cancel culture people go on about today. It's the idea that if you follow the wrong person, you don't deserve things. Or if you are an influencer and then you don't say the right thing or whatever, then you don't deserve things either. You should be homeless. You should be punished by having your job taken away from you, right? The back of the book has a bunch of, make sure to check this out. The back of the book, this current edition, has a bunch of quotes that are paraphrases of things that people said on Twitter when they saw this book cover. Some of the people just hated Chris Catron and they're like, fuck, he found another platform? Other people hated Slavoj Žižek. Other people hated Norman Finkelstein. A whole lot of people hated Nina Power. The point is some people hated all of them and tried to say, oh, well, Theory Underground is just a knockoff brand of Sublation Media or Platypus Affiliated Society or Spikes Magazine or Unheard. I don't even know half these platforms I just listed. But the point is, is when you don't have a platform from which to speak, you go to one of the ones that I just listed. Compact Magazine is another one that they listed. We're not even doing what they're doing. We're an education platform. These are lecture courses that we're offering. I'm a solo educator who brings on other educators. It's a completely different dynamic. But anyway, a lot of people had a lot of shit to say. The first one, this is an actual quote, though. It's a direct quote. People who purchase this book should be barred from public life. 
This is the essence of what I'm talking about in my piece, which is discursive Taylorism. So I hope that I gave you all a sense for what the PMC is, for what discursive Taylorism is, for how that kind of relates to stuff that we do nowadays. What's the lefter than thou enjoyment thing? Should I just leave you on a cliffhanger? You check it out for yourself. I'll say a, a basic thing, all right? He, Catron was correct. There is something to Theory Underground, uh, its relationship with Lacan, right? Dead French dude. Why do we care? He made Freud, Freud relevant in the 20th century. Is that enough? No, not for me. I was obstinately opposed to taking Lacan seriously for the better part of a decade until Michael Downs convinced me it was worth checking, going deeper into, right? And so I brought him onto my channel at the time that I was deciding to stop being an influencer and start doing like some kind of education for my own sake and hopefully other people get something from it. So I brought him on and he taught me the basics of Lacan, then he taught me the basics of Zizek, and it's kind of changed how I see things and in a very important way, especially on the level of this word, jouissance. Whereas we've been joking around all tour, juissance. Because it sounds goofy, jouissance. Why do we say that, right? Todd McGowan refuses to even say jouissance. He says enjoyment. But that creates a lot of confusion. So he's got this disagreement now with Richard Boothby, who's also an academic. Boothby insists, it's got to be jouissance. You cannot translate it from French because if you say enjoyment, it's just going to confuse people because we all associate enjoyment with running around going, ha, 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 ha. And it has nothing to do with that. So jouissance, enjoyment, this kind of enjoyment has to do with some kind of a sick, perverse pleasure that is gained from undermining our pleasure. Pleasure used in the sense of equilibrium, everything is going well, we've got control of the situation, my books are in order, uh, I know where I'm going, I know what's happening, everything's on lock, it's all under control. Pleasure, I'm happy, I'm at the beach. Jouissance is what comes in and says, no. Okay, so what is jouissance? It's road rage, it's gambling, it's binge shopping, it's binge eating. It's drug addiction, it's alcohol addiction. It's pretty much almost every kind of addiction. But the most important thing about it is it's that aspect of us that we can't come to terms with. It's that aspect of us that we go, why do I keep doing this thing? I don't even understand why I keep doing this thing. And you don't recognize yourself when you do this thing because the conscious ego says, well, I desire happiness, I desire pleasure, I desire like the good life. But there's all this, this part of you that's getting worked up while driving for no apparent reason, right? So what Lacan develops is this idea of jouissance. It kind of comes from Freud's piece, Beyond the Pleasure Principle. The idea is, if we take ourselves to be rational pleasure-seeking actors, we're in for a surprise. Humans also get something by undermining the pleasure principle. So death drive gives us jouissance. Okay, some technical terminology, why does it matter? Basically this, I'm just gonna say it so you don't even have to read my piece. And that is the left, how do we define the left? The post-left, how do we define the post-left? The anti-left, how do we define the anti-left? How we define these things, how we include people in our in-group in, in these ideas, and how we use those to exclude other people, that itself is a form of enjoyment that undermines the obtainment of the reality that we want to even be moving towards in the first place. Hipster enjoyment and leftist enjoyment are the same thing. In a, in a very, it, it, at least they're very similar. And that is, oh, oh, you're wearing that? I was wearing that like five years ago. Oh, you listen to that band? I listened to that band before they sold out. Right? You should be familiar with the mindset, but obviously it's kind of like, ooh, we're, on, we're pushing the frontiers of consumerism. We're consuming the things that nobody else is consuming way ahead of the losers who are like shopping in lockstep, right? The niche consumer boutique bullshit that we do, that we, where we buy our identities, and we try to be the first ones to do so, and so that every, by the time everyone else is doing it, we've already moved on to the next thing, moves into 
the political sphere at the time that politics is completely depoliticized and is pretty much just cultural, right? So it's supposed to be a slap in the face psh, psh, on myself and everyone else to say, are we just enjoying being lefter than thou at everybody else's expense, at our own expense, at the expense of a future itself? The professional managerial class also kind of referred to by Mark Fisher as like this priestly vampire castle, whatever, right? It gets this enjoyment from spotting imperfections and pointing them out and saying, this person doesn't deserve that platform. This person doesn't deserve a job. This person doesn't deserve, doesn't deserve, doesn't deserve. And oh, we are the deserving ones, right? So left than now, PMC, discursive Taylorism. These are the three ideas that I want people to think about. Um, if you really want the idea to take hold, don't buy the book Underground Theory here, or we'll get in trouble. Buy it online, or buy it from us after we've left the premises. I hope that you will check out my piece. But that's it, pretty much. There you go. Thank you so much for having me. I would love to take questions, but I think what we're going to do is we're going to move through the three of us really quickly. And then we're going to kind of sit together and like, you can ask all of us a question, or you can ask any one of us a question, and we'll do that until our time is up. And so I'm going to turn this thing over in a second here to Nance. So all you need to know about Nance is he's a random skateboarder who was hitchhiking, and we picked him up. And he's been with us ever since. That's it. Nah, he's taken a bunch of courses at Theory Underground. He's committed a lot of time and energy to this project. And uh, my God, we love him. All right, please put your hands together to welcome up Bryce Nance. Okie dokie, artichoke. Hello, everybody. Hello, Hello Internet. Welcome to our little dance party at the end of the world. Um, and that came out of a conversation Dave and I had a while ago about all the stuff that's going on at Theory Underground and how it's kind of insane and intense and we do a bunch of stuff and it, it takes a lot of effort. Um, and a lot of normal people in my life and in, in our lives don't seem to get it. But I'm convinced it's a way forward and if it's not a way forward, then it, at least it's a dance party at the end of the world, and at least we can have a little bit of fun um, while we're doing it. Because I got burnt out on standard leftist spaces. Uh, I thought I was an anarchist my whole life. I thought I was a communist my whole life. I've been a worker. I uh, became a parent at a really young age. And I never really had anything going for me other than um, work and work and work and work and then like a like a hope somewhere in the back of my mind or maybe somewhere deep down in my soul uh, but there was never any effective path to like actualize that so I was just kind of like holding out hope um, in the face of daily confirmation that I was fucking insane for continuing to give a shit um, and maybe I am and maybe you all are too and welcome that's cool. I'm going to read a little bit from my piece in the Underground Theory volume. Um, and then we'll just keep it moving. I really do want to get to some conversation. So my piece in Underground Theory is called The PMC and the Walls That Separate Us from Them. And uh, I'm going to read the section called Walls, Good, Bad, Necessary, and Fucked. Walls are things upon which one might scrawl a message for the sake of posterity or create an illicit work of art with a political message or even wheat paste the giant advertisement for one's clothing brand. Things upon which one can write a skateboard, though only briefly. Things upon which one might stand and make grand proclamations, or maybe just climb, climb up to get a better view of a passing spectacle. Things through which one might victoriously break. Walls are also concepts, or conceptual objects, that serve to maintain distinctions between other seemingly discrete concepts or objects. Walls are all these things and more. Any four walls, so to speak, may indeed become a prison. Yet walls can also offer security, privacy, or a dedicated space. Today, there is a tendency to want all spaces to be the same. 
but walls create the possibility for turning meaningless space into purposeful places. We all need a safe place to keep the objects we collect through the course of living our lives as a safeguard against inertia and impermanence. Walls provide the framework upon which we hang all sorts of meaning, personal photographs or artwork. This is not just aesthetic, but a necessary reminder that we are in fact here and that the moments in our lives actually occurred and do matter, if only to ourselves. Purposeful places must be made intentionally, set aside from the rest of the world with signs and symbols, imbued with significance that transcends our singular existence and connects us to others in real ways. Let's take a look at how walls relate to the university. There are no raiders who roam countrysides and pillage whatever they can get their hands on for the most part. There are no hordes of invading foreign brutes to be kept out. There are no existential necessities for walls. Nevertheless, the university cannot exist without them. Physical walls are not, are not things that I am the biggest fan of. I'm one of those silly people who believes in freedom of movement and unfettered access to public property and all that. But I'm not actually talking about physical walls here. I'm talking about institutional walls. I feel conflicted here because I don't like the idea of force being used to keep people out of places or locked in. But there has to be a way to maintain the integrity of institutions and the adherence to their principles without resorting to exclusion and expropriation. Universities, in theory, exist to serve the public at large, and I want to live in a world where that is true. Universities are the reason we have nice things. We have the nice things we have in our society today. Space rockets and the internet and theories of evolution, gravity and history and art and all the myriad things that make our modern lives possible and comfortable. We wouldn't recognize life without universities as a life worth living. Yet they have become a rude imitation of their idealized form that exists to serve rather than the public rather than the public and the furthering of the human experience, nothing more than ideology and the status quo and the all-powerful dollar. As Carl Jasper says in The Idea of the University, the university owes its existence to society, which desires that somewhere within its confines, pure, independent, unbiased research be carried on. Society wants the university because it feels that the pure service of truth somewhere within its orbit serves its own interests. No state intolerant of any restriction on its power for fear of the consequences of a pure search for truth will ever allow a genuine university to exist. But we have a tendency today to blame all of the failures of the university on neoliberalization, as though all of its inherent contradictions and problems would vanish with enough, with enough public funding. Taking the side of the state against big business seems like an easy solution until we, re we remember that universities in the Soviet Union lost their way as well. We can't just say capitalism bad, anything opposed to it good, because we have seen where that gets us. Under Soviet direction, universities became nothing more than outlets reproducing Stalinist dogma. They lost sight of their ostensible objectives and substituted the party line for that whole true thing. So yes, capital gets in the way of the university's pursuits. And we must do the work of building a new foundation upon which institutions may stand but we must not forget the failures of those we might otherwise be inclined to mimic in our efforts to produce an ideal society. If we treat the university and the human enrichment that it purports to offer as commodities, we'll never get anything other than the reproduction of current conditions. That's the exact opposite of what the university is supposed to do. The university is supposed to be the anteroom at the end of the universe, the vestibule that stands just outside nirvana or heaven or the future of humankind. But it has been turned into a kitschy cool kids club for pretentious liberals edgy orthodox bros, and unky fuck, uncle fucking money bags. Um, and the rest of it's probably better, so buy the book. Um, all the other pieces are better. Um, but I am very pleased to be included in a, a diverse collection of, of thought and contributions for people like me. I failed, failed out of college three times. I fucking graduated an alternative high school because I suck. Uh, and then there's awesome, really awesome academics and shit that are included, so it's really cool. Um, Anne's going to come up and give her piece, and, and then we'll keep moving on. Um, so yeah, thank you all, and welcome Anne. Um, hello, everyone. Thank you so much for being here, for spending your what is it, Friday? Friday <laughs> evening with us. Wow, that means a lot. Um, we, uh, we'll be hanging out at a bar down the street. I can't remember the name. Someone knows the name. That place. 
Um, after this, we can talk, hang out, get some drinks. Um, but I'm going to also, in the spirit of this book tour, be reading a little part of my piece that I contributed to the anthology, as well as telling you a little bit more about it. Um, my piece is called The Idea of the Neoliberal University, Reflections of a Disenfranchised College Graduate. Um, I have the unique experience of having been an undergraduate student, a researcher of the neoliberal higher education, and an adjunct instructor all within kind of the same four year period of time. Um, and within doing the research, being a student, um, and being an instructor, I had a lot of experiences. I read a lot of literature that really made me, like to put it simply, very cynical and angry at the university and the maybe not so quality education that I felt I received. Uh, and after reading The Idea of the University with Theory Underground, I went, whoa, 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 something's missing here. I think we've, we've fallen away from Carl Jasper's idea of the university, which is a community of scholars and students engaged in the task of truth seeking. Um, this is all from my experience in a public university in the Pacific Northwest as a predominantly white institution. Um, so obviously I cannot speak on the experiences of people at arts colleges, liberal arts colleges, uh, Ivy League universities. However, um, a lot of the sociological literature and research out there currently shares some similar kind of anecdotes and research into experiences at public universities. And so um, I first want to read a section called The University Then and Now. The quality of education at the university in the United States has declined over the years, especially for its rapidly increasing price. The National Center for Educational Statistics found that the average cost of a public four-year college in 1986 was $3,856 in current dollars, whereas the cost in 2017 was over four times as much at $20,050. Not only has the cost changed, but the education itself is much different than what students in the 60s and 70s received. Christopher Newfield, author of Unmaking the Public University, states it best when he says, Human development, self-actualization, and spiritual and creative welfare of various kinds were all equally important goals and would be pursued by the new builders of a majoritarian economy. The colleges and universities were fountainheads and pricing grounds of the values and goals of educated men, those who served not the production of foods and associated planning, but the intellectual and artistic development of man. But a rising culture war and fear of an anti-war socialist political agenda amongst college-educated citizens scared the conservative elites, and the nature of the university began to change, shifting away from the arts and humanities that were causing this liberal indoctrination. Universities became neoliberalized, emphasizing corporate and practical majors, all in the pursuit of profit, leaving the liberal arts and humanities behind. The idea that business and technical majors should be prioritized over arts and humanities was not a new idea. And this is the quote that David referenced earlier. In 1909, Woodrow Wilson, who was the president of Princeton University at the time, stated in an address to the New York City School Teachers Association, we want one class of persons to have a liberal education, and we want another class of persons, a very much larger class of necessity in every society, to forego the privileges of a liberal education and fit themselves to perform, to perform specific difficult manual tasks. The liberal arts and humanities were viewed as a privilege for the few, and the rest of society had to sacrifice these fields to keep the capitalist machine running. In our hyperproductive, social media addicted, capitalist US society, many people, and especially professional managerial or PMC bound college students, don't seem to realize the importance of the arts and humanities. These fields help us develop critical thinking, cultural knowledge, self-actualization, and find meaning in our lives. They've even influenced entire periods of history, like the Renaissance, the Enlightenment, and the American Revolution. Um, as Christopher Newfield explains, we can think of human development as a central, though largely undiscussed, outcome of the liberal arts. Music, dance, theater, literature, sculpture, film, and other disciplines normally operated in two different levels. They produced enhanced, even Dionysian states of cognitive capability that overcame, at least for a time, the limits of our ordinary condition. They allowed the imagination of a higher permanent state of both individuals and humanity as a whole, one that would be more equitable, more peaceful, much smarter, and on a daily basis more ambitious and less defensive. I believe Carl Jaspers would agree with this sentiment. He sees the university as a place for students and scholars to pursue truth and knowledge of all sorts. 
and its mission becomes lost when we instrumentalize and departmentalize knowledge and the various fields of study. Jaspers reiterates many times throughout the idea of the university that humans have a fundamental and primary thirst for knowledge. In the age of late stage neoliberal capitalism and social media, I can't say if this sentiment remains true, but giving Jaspers and humanity the benefit of the doubt here, we see that the modern US university fails to support this quest for truth and knowledge. The modern neoliberal university's goals are to make a profit, attract the most students who will pay the high price, make deals with corporations, and get students their degrees as easily as possible so they can get out there into the working world. I want to share some of my own experiences, reflections, and analysis on how neoliberalism manifests in the university, but we must first understand what neoliberalism is and how it affects the university. And so I then have a section on the neoliberal university and neoliberalism as defined by David Harvey in his book, A Brief Introduction or Brief History of Neoliberalism. Um, he explains that it is the doctrine that market exchange is an ethic in itself capable of acting as a guide for all human action. And so what that means for the university is that it is run as a business rather than an institution for learning. So students are now viewed as consumers rather than as truth seekers. Um, some of the other ways in which neoliberalism manifests within the university um, is that education no longer exists for education's sake, but there is now a, you know, a PMC careerist oriented ends to the education. Um, students receive what is coined by Christopher Newfield as limited learning as opposed to full service learning. So students within these institutions are leaving the school with a very limited set of maybe very career specific skills without kind of that broad, full, general knowledge that we think we're supposed to have when we graduate from a public university. And of course, students are left with lifetime crippling debt. Um, and so throughout this uh, piece, I kind of explain my experiences as a student instructor and researcher. Um, I talk about personal experiences. I talk about the literature. Um, experiences such as having really no rigor in my classes. I mean, I primarily studied sociology and throughout that time, I was not assigned a single primary text from any foundational sociologist. No Marx, no Weber, no Durkheim, maybe a blurb or two in uh, a textbook, but that was the extent of it. Um, some of my best classes where we did read full books like uh, Aristotle's politics, democracy in America, were taught by a professor who has been canceled multiple times and tried to be kicked off the university for, to put it briefly, being a conservative in Idaho. Um, I also noticed low effort behaviors from uh, my peers and my students, which is not necessarily their fault as individuals. I think the entire system is just set up in a way that fosters, advertise, funds the beer and circus, as it's called um, in one of my the sociological texts, or the, the Greek life and the sports culture. Um, rather than focusing on their, their education, students are also dealing with the debt, dealing with the high cost of education. Many of them are working full-time jobs, um, and the university really doesn't have any institutional supports for them as well. And so overall, no one's really just there to learn. I say no one. Not many students are just there to learn and dig into critical, difficult texts and theory. It's all it's too much for them. They've got a million other things going on in their lives. Um, and so some of that is highlighted within the piece. But the part I wanted to share with you all today actually comes directly out of the research that I did with a program um, at Boise State University called the Intermountain Social Research Lab. And so throughout that time, I worked with this cohort for two, uh, two years. And we each choose a topic based in or based around uh, studying neoliberal higher education. And then we, we choose something specific in our own specific interests uh, within that field. And we develop interview instruments um, within that group and conduct hour-long interviews with volunteer students. And so throughout the course of my time, I probably conducted 20 to 30 interviews, transcribed way more than I want to remember. Um, and we had probably 100 interviews to work with over the course of that time. And so I wanted to share some of the, the quotes from these students during the 2019 and 2020 school years, um, because I think it's really interesting, you know, you can hear me and hear my experiences, but many students were experiencing similar things, and I think their voices are really powerful in understanding the, the downfalls of the university and the kind of lack of meeting expectations that I think a lot of students had. And so we will start here 
Um, oh, and each student has been given a pseudonym to protect their identity. This is not their real names. Um, but when asked about the quality of his classes, Chris shared, I think many of my classes, it's just sort of regurgitating information. And not that they're not good teachers or anything like that, but I feel like most of my classes have not put that much of an emphasis on critical thinking and taking things away that aren't explicitly told to you. Chris recognizes that something is missing from his classes, that rather than focusing on critical thinking or rigorous discussions of knowledge and truth, information is simply regurgitated, spoon-fed to the students with no real work required from them. And while some, some students have never really experienced a true academic challenge and thus complain about more challenging classes, many students still desire classes that expand their minds and support the idea of truth-seeking. In every interview, we ask students a question along the lines of, how would your life be different if your education were free? Most students had a very similar answer. They would take more courses of interest, like those in the liberal arts, because they enjoy learning. But the current cost of higher education is too much to justify taking superfluous courses that aren't directly related to their major. Take Paul, for example, who explained, I could take different classes and kind of search for what I want to do instead of kind of picking something and like, I can't go experimenting in another class because it's like 800 bucks. If it was free, I could explore a little more. Some students, however, were duped by this neoliberal ideology that puts the liberal arts and humanities into the extra or unimportant category. They believed that they needed to study practical degrees, even if it wasn't what they were truly passionate about. Lily is an example of someone who changed her major out of fear of not being able to make enough money in the liberal arts. She says, I think there are jobs for people who major in the liberal arts. Now, are they well-paying jobs? I don't know. I think that you can definitely get a well-paying job, but it might be harder. I mean, I think it's possible, but I feel like overall I get nervous when it comes to certain majors like that because I would love to be a music major or I'd love to be, I used to do theater, like I'd love that. But in terms of having, making money in the future and making good money and supporting your family, like I want to ensure that. And I don't know if that can totally happen with a job with one of those majors. I definitely would consider doing an elective that is related to those things. I think that's awesome. I think that once again, it's cool to spread yourself and learn new things. And actually, I was originally a media arts major as of the first week of school. And then I immediately switched. I just didn't like it, but I also was media arts. I was doing journalism, and that's an iffy career choice. Journalism, especially with everything being online now. So that was kind of in the back of my mind. Like, is it smart to be in this? Like, will I make money doing that? Rather than feeling secure enough to pursue something she is passionate about, something that would fulfill her and potentially give her a more rewarding college experience, a more Jasperian experience, if you will, Lily felt a financial pressure and burden to choose what society and the neoliberal university has deemed as practical or safe, uh, marketing in her case. In terms of thinking about their future careers and what they want and value in life, many students expressed a desire for a meaningful career, one that aligns with their values, allows them freedom and flexibility, and genuinely makes an impact. When asked to comment on the corporate and ultra-productive hustle culture we see in America today, Vivian states, I don't like that. I'm not a big fan of that. Most likely our time on earth is maybe 70 to 80 years if we're good. And if you're just working the entirety of it, I think the reason why you're put on earth is not to just work, not enjoy your life, not create an impact on the world. Like I have some friends in Vietnam, you know, since I'm from there, but they're expats from UK, Europe, America, and they hated their previous jobs. They worked in the corporate fields or they were very stressful. They hated that because they lost all enjoyment. And just by their job of being an English teacher in Vietnam or, you know, doing something simple, they're like, I can enjoy life. I can make an impact or do something productive without hating myself. Vivian states that she is not a big fan of this culture and she characterizes it as something that makes us unhappy and that is less impactful on the world. In our short time on earth, she explains that it is important that we enjoy our lives and not get bogged down by, the corp by corporate America. This corporate workaholic culture is in direct opposition to an enjoyable and meaningful life, which Vivian doesn't seem to think is possible while working a meaningless corporate job after college. College graduates face a looming precarity as they prepare to enter the neoliberal workforce, but they want and value something better than that. Students want to enjoy their time on earth and not be stuck in corporate jobs. And they want to enjoy their time at the university, yet 
their, one of their solutions to the problems and fears caused by neoliberalism, capitalism in general, the inflation, cost of living, debt, etc., is to take the courses that are boring and oriented towards career prep that they think will help them land secure jobs at corporations. Some students admit that they will do whatever it takes to secure a job. In the same interview, Vivian, who just had the quote from before, admits the following when asked if she would be more likely to apply for a position at a corporation that is present on campus. She says, I would say like, so if I'm just graduating college and I'm desperate for a job, I'm desperate for a job, and I would apply at any company. I think that would give me a leg up. For example, I've considered going to grad school at University of Oregon or Willamette University just because I know Adidas and Intel recruit there. Like for a first job, ethics, I wish they mattered more. Ethics do matter to me, but there's a desperation to start building your resume. Vivian expresses that the pressure to get a job right away makes her desperate for a job at any company. Even though she knows that corporate jobs are unfulfilling, she would be willing to accept a job at any company despite her own ethics. What really stands out in her answer is her admission that maybe ethics don't matter much when looking for a first job. Neoliberalism has succeeded in altering the course of people, people's lives and forcing their priorities towards corporatism and being a lifetime employee. Vivian's response does not point to a failure in her own judgments, but to a failure of the university for allowing her own ethics and morals, arguably one of the most important foundational philosophical concepts for theorizing about what is the good life to be trumped by neoliberal and corporate values. Nicholas, who studied business management at the time, gave a very telling response when asked about how he feels he's getting his money's worth at the university. He says, I have to have this piece of paper that says I'm certified to do this, and I guess that's why I'm getting this degree. Students no longer conceive of the university as a hub of truth-seeking and gaining knowledge for knowledge's sake. It is now simply the overly priced four-year job preparation school where maybe they learn some history and philosophy on the side, if they're lucky. The idea of the university is dying, and students are likely becoming more and more disillusioned and fatalistic, as we see nothing radically changing within our higher education system or in American society more broadly. The university has not equipped students with any sort of imagination or Jasperian framework to hope for anything better than what is currently being offered. And in the conclusion of my piece, I admit I have not given up all of my faith in the university. I'm actually in the process of applying for a master's degree at the exact same institution that I was just complaining about in this piece. Um, and part of it is obviously the economic benefits of being an in-state student uh, because of the connections that I made with wonderful professors who do uphold the idea of the university. But it's also because I believe in the idea of the university and I believe that it will always exist so long as there are students that care, that there are people that care, that there are instructors and professors that care about the students and about knowledge itself. Um, and more gen generally, you know, thinking about our audience here, a lot of people being associated with platypus affiliated society, um, a Marxist ish organization. Um, something about in the liberal arts and the humanities. Equipping students with that knowledge, not only does it make life better because art, philosophy, literature is just cool and makes life worth living, but in thinking about building a revolution, a class, class solidarity, uh, critiquing capitalism, the neoliberal university is completely thwarting that effort because of the crippling debt, because of the emphasis in business and all these other areas. Students don't actually get the chance to read foundational texts, read Marx, read critiques of Marx. It's all very stifled, um, and I hope that, you know, by the existence of alternative uh, education platforms and organizations like Theory Underground, Platypus, lots of other organizations out there, as well as students going into the university and saying, no, give me the philosophy courses back. I mean, right now, in applying for at Boise State, um, I have to figure out what courses I want to take right now. And every week I go back and have a meeting with my advisor, there's fewer and fewer philosophy courses. They're actively being pulled from the curriculum. Um, and it's frustrating. And I say, no, I'll write about that in my thesis. I don't care. Like, screw you guys. And so uh, long live the idea of the university, I suppose. Thank you so much for your time. I think we're going to start our panel now. It's going to be awesome. Thank you. And uh, we'll start fielding questions as we set up the panel right here. If you've got to go right now, you can take off. But uh, I think we've got a little bit of time to take some questions, have a bit of a conversation. You can start taking the questions, though. Cool. And, uh, yeah, we'll I guess I'll start panel. while they get set up. Yes, we're going to have you. Um, if you can use his microphone, folks online can hear you. It's got to be turned up to six. I'll do it. You can start. Come on. Just 
I don't know how loud I should talk. I can't. Okay. Um, Let it all out. Uh, okay. Um, so, Dave, in your talk, you stated the, I think I wrote it down somewhere, but that you are trying to create, that there's a necessity to create like a culture um, that is a sort of alternative to like the PC SJW, what's going on right now. And I, I was just, my question is like, what? How does this creating like an alternative culture um, place the relevance of Marxism back on the table? And like, is it about creating like merely creating a culture? Because it, I, I just, I'm trying to get like a clarification on on what what the connection with Marxism is here. Like, do you see Marxism as a culture or like? as a sort of like weapon to combat the, the current, like sti of course stifling climate. Um, because it, I, I just don't, right now based on that, I don't see the sort of necessity for Marxism. Um. Thank you, yeah. Um, and Chris and Anne, and go ahead and come on up, sit at the table here, so it's not just me. So let me see if I understand the question correctly. Are you asking, so you heard me saying that what we need is a sort of counterculture to the PMC. I like how you brought in SJW. I never said that, but it's true. It's true though, the PMC is kind of responsible for that. Yeah, 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 for sure. Well, I think that the underground exists I don't like this chair at all. Now I'm like way too low. I'm like, yeah, I feel like I'm a little kid. Uh, do we have enough chairs. Can, can a couple of those chairs be brought up here? This little, I tell you, you know, they really do think of students in universities as like oversized kindergartners. And all you have to do is look at the furniture they give you, right? Try to sit at a table on that furniture. It doesn't work. Like. So anyway, um, so I don't think that the underground needs to be created. I think that it already exists. I think that it exists because there's a society that excludes everyone who doesn't get the right credentials but nonetheless wants to think and obsess about these fields of knowledge, who wants access to thinking about these things and being able to engage with other people in dialogue. And so it exists, we're, we're there, but the it is the separation, like, oh, that's just, that's just people online, they just tune in for this kind of stuff, and that's fine, right? That's kind of the assumption, and our counterpoint is just like, no, this is the beginning, this is like the rumbles of what will hopefully become an actual working class intellectual movement. And not just intellectual, but actually from that intellectual working class movement, better things. And I think that the thing that I wish that I had said during my talk, and I was kicking myself for not having said it, I was thinking about it the whole time, I gotta find a way to tie this in, is that we need, we, as in just like regular working class people, need the PMC. And that the professional managerial class needs to be self-conscious about its role in the reproduction of capitalism and a class society. And I think that people like Catron here are actively working to make that happen. He's looking around at the students here and he's going, come on guys, realize that you are in history, right? This isn't the end of history. This doesn't need to just be the dance party at the end. Um, and so that's what I would say to that. But thank you for that question. And then I'll, I'll start running the mic to people. Yeah, this is a question for Dave, um, and I felt like it was in your presentation, but I, I kind of want to raise it explicitly, right? So I was thinking about Burnham, and I, I recently read Deutscher's biography of Trotsky, and this really came to the forefront, that Burnham's kind of formulation of the managerial revolution was his post-Marxism, right? Was his, rec from a Trotsky's perspective, it was a pessimism about the ability of the working class to seize power, right? So do you see a tension between Marxism 
and managerial theory uh, that Burnham himself even acknowledged that to, to believe in the managerial revolution meant not being a Marxist anymore. Thank you. Thanks, Darian. Yes, I think that there's a lot of Marxists today who are professors or students who just say, well, I'm a worker too because I don't own the means of production. And it's like, yeah, well, there was a split between the owners and controllers a long time ago. And I think Burnham's basic thesis is that it wasn't just Soviet society where some bu new bureaucratic class stepped in to mediate the contradictions of capitalism, but it was actually happening everywhere in the developed world. And so he saw fascism, communism, and liberalism as just three ideological sort of superstructural um, manifestations or articulations of those contradictions, um, but that ultimately it's the same sort of class groupings in every one of these societies stepping in to mediate for these contradictions. And then there's a the whole question of like, can that actually be done? How much can those be mediated? Can we just do MMT and, and keep the whole thing chugging along forever? Um, I don't think so. And so I think going back to your question and then now yours, the relevance of Marxism, I think, is I think to become a little bit more pessimistic and negative about the possibilities of social democracy. And that Marxism is one of the most thoroughgoing, well, it is the most thoroughgoing attempt to understand the kind of society that we live in and pr to propose something in terms of like how to get out of it, right? And so I think that Marxism is essential for that, but I do believe that, um, that this sort of whitewashing of the role of this ideological and managing, controlling section of the working class undermines the attempts of any new Marxism to do what it wants to do. And so I don't know that I have a lot of faith that any solutions are going to come from currently existing entities, but I also admit a profound degree of ignorance concerning uh, the actual existing groups, right? So I've been in, I've been in the DSA, I've been in some uh, class-based Marxist groups within the DSA that were trying to split from the DSA, um, and I know a lot of people who have in their own ways, um, and I'm just going off that. I'm, it's my limited understanding, but I, from where I stand, I don't see anybody um, who's got like a plausible way forward out of the situation. And my book, which I also meant to plug and actually tie into my talk, Time Energy, um, gets at what I think is a, an essential piece of the puzzle. And I think that any movement that can actually do something to capital is going to have to get the memo, really. And that is that workers don't just need representation. Workers don't just need shorter working days. Workers don't just need higher wages. Workers need the abolition of the working class. And I'm not so sure that that will just come from workers. I don't think that will just come from the PMC. I don't know who or where or how it's going to come about. But I know that we need our time energy if we want to have meaningful friendships, relationships, families, or develop our skills, find our talents, live our best lives, as liberals say. Like, if we are to do that, it actually requires time energy, and time energy is just large, energy-infused, repeatable blocks of time throughout the week. Currently, we don't have that because it is being reduced to labor power sold in the market on the auction block of the global market, right? So um, I hope someone will ask some questions that aren't just of me, though. Yeah, here's for Chris. So I wanted, like to, to, I wanted to pose also for you guys, like, in terms of theory underground and you know the project, how this is very much like a 2023 kind of moment, because um, you know, as you guys know, I published a book recently, "The Death of the Millennial Left," that is about this retrospective view of how the millennial left came up and basically puttered out um, in the DSA, to my mind. Um, and so this is like a kind of taking stock or retrospective moment. It's also a kind of lead up to whatever shit show is going to be on the agenda next year in the election. Um, and 
you mentioned post left and anti left, like that kind of Benedict Cryptofash or other kinds of uh, people on the internet um, who are extremely disenchanted with the left as such. And how do you understand your project in light of this this current moment with respect to that, where the DSA is waning? where there is a lot of disenchantment with the left, there's a lot of burnout, obviously, but even beyond burnout, there's a lot of um, kind of snapping out of it, you know, um, and uh, a kind of abandonment of maybe the progressive illusion that motivated the, you know, you talked about progressivism, so how do, what does it mean for the millennial left to have resolved itself as a kind of just the latest wave of progressive liberal Democrat politics. Yeah, let's go. <laughs> We're all like, we don't got nothing. <laughs> I don't know. I, I think, uh, yeah, being, being burnout on the left, being disillusioned and, and realizing, um, you know, maybe I, I'm disenfranchised, but maybe the left was never a franchise for me. <laughs> Um, I don't know. There's, there's definitely an element of, uh, I mean, cynically, I, I want to look and just say, oh, well, it, it was bullshit all along. Um, from, from my position as um, just a regular working dude, um, I've never had access to um, a public. I've never had access to representation. Um, and I, you know, you could problematize that and identity groups and all that. And I accept that to a degree. I, I do. Um, but materially on the ground, I, you know, I used to work 70 hours a week, um, raising children, trying to feed them, trying to provide them adequate housing and, and adequate, um, spiritual rearing, if you will. Um, like all the things that actually matter don't seem to matter to the media left to um, left movements writ large when it came down to Medicare for all that I was excited about. You know, I haven't been to the doctor in, in a decade um, and that sucks. And the movement for Medicare for all got hijacked by misguided young people. And it bothers me that misguided young people have more power in these left spaces that I still do care about. I am still committed to it. Um, but it, it just, it seems silly. Can I say something? Like the part, oh wait. Oh, I'm really yeah, excited. indeed. No, no, no. Feel free, feel free. Okay, so like. Just gonna I mean, get you the microphone yeah. first. So that like you said like about <laughs> this part like misguided. From like completely different cultural background. I was like born and raised in China. So like, um, just like what you said um, in your article, like the war. The whole country, like all the people, we're living under this war. And inside this like utopian world, everything seems like so structured and disciplined, but everything is just a bubble. Yeah. It's everything is like it's just a bubble. And like the first time like I came to the States and I see that, oh, the world is actually like this. That's mm -hmm. the real world. I was like, I was still even though I'm out of China, my mind is still like stuck back mm -hmm. in China. Like mm -hmm. I feel like this well, actually, my whole childhood set, it's still like, I'm not, I don't think I'm still free. I'm on the way of breaking free, but I'm still really um, struggling of being free because we have this big thing in China. I, I don't know if any of you have been to China. Okay, you, you oh, <laughs> it's just so, okay, I love my country, but like, and it has like amazing culture, but this thing I want to point out that it's, it's the, like the gates. Chinese people, there's some the characteristic that was just signal only Chinese have. They're nosy as hell. <laughs> so like literally like, anyone, you just go down to the street like that, especially as a foreigner who look different than Chinese, there's only one ethnicity, which is Asian. They will be like, you're like a celebrity. People were just like watching over you. And it's like, I am, and we cannot dress what we want. Mm. And we don't have freedom and it sucks. So like, even though right now I, I was, I, I still feel like I, I was kind of stuck, but what you said, what you guys said, it's so inspiring. I do feel like I'm like 80% from Bert Zeffrey, like 85, maybe after today. Okay, I'm going back. Okay, but why did I say, I have like this little problem I had. So I 
kind of, I came to the States and I realized this, um, I don't know, like something I, I kind of like picked up on American kids. American kids, they were like really rebellious. I don't know why, but like, I do feel like Americans around me, they were like, so rebellious and so just not give a shit. I was like, how can they, how, how can they actually do that? Cause like they don't like, literally give a shit about anything. And I, I, I was kind of wondering like, why is um, like the whole thing, why is the generation shaped like in this way? Um, yeah, and some like you guys point of view on that. And definitely your point of view of China, which I think is communism, right? I don't know about politics, but like, I think we're common. <laughs> Something. I don't know. I actually don't about know that about that. The after party, but mm -hmm. I guess like Nance probably has a whole bunch to say on that question. Are you a rebel? <laughs> <laughs> I was not rebellious. Actually, I was the opposite. I got tried my hardest to get straight A's, and I cried the first time I got a B in fourth grade because I thought. Uh, it meant that I wasn't worth anything, that I wasn't good enough, and that I wouldn't, you know, be this success story that I was supposed to be coming from uh, an upper middle class family on, on the track to the PMC. Um, everything's, like, fucked up. And I think the rebellion is, a re like, part of it's a response to that, I want to say. The res a response to the prospect of, especially for us young people, like, like we've seen for probably a decade more of our lives when we first came became aware of it at what the age of 10, 11, 12, the climate crisis, and we've seen nothing at all fundamentally change. We know we're going into a weird future with weird climate events, climate catastrophes, climate migration and immigration. Like, we're going to have to deal with that. We see the, like, I don't know if we're ever going to own our own house. Things like that, it really does just kind of give you a whatever, I'll just do my thing, live my life, I don't care about anything or anyone else. Um, and I think, you know, I get that, but also I think we have a responsibility to, at, in the, you know, in the limited time and energy that we have, I think we have a responsibility to ourselves and to each other to not completely give up hope. Um, but I get it. And I think Nance would probably, you know, say the same thing and Dave would probably say the same thing. And I won't, I'll let you all speak for yourselves, but like the future is just, especially in America, it's so sad. It's so depressing. I mean, people at this point are like, I won't have kids. I'm not going to bring kids into this messed up world. And it could be argued that like, having children for a lot of people is a very meaningful thing. To wor we're at the point now where people are even giving that sentiment up and going, heck no, I'm not bringing kids into this messed up world. That's sad. That's really sad that our society is at that point. Oh, no. Yeah, yeah. okay. okay. I was so interrupt. Oh, you're good. No, I was just like, I think like, Americans, like not, no offense, <laughs> but you guys actually have a lot. Like freedom, mm -hmm. like mm -hmm. I think, I know like sometimes some things here are fucked up, but at least you guys are free. Mm -hmm. You can decide what to do. Because we can't. We, mm -hmm. we, right, I don't know about them. Like, I believe there's some Chinese here because I, I, there's like a lot of Asian in school, which is, mm -hmm. I don't, thank you. Yeah. I love America. Okay, <laughs> but yeah, yeah. I think like, honestly, I think you guys actually have a lot of things. Mm -hmm. But I do think like the kids right now, they don't see that. They're asking for more. I want more. The country's bad. I hate my country, blah, blah, blah. And I was like, actually, you, you guys have freedom. Why can't you, like, they don't realize that of, like, the things they had. Actually, it's a lot. Like, yeah. I, I don't know. Yeah. Yeah, so let me just speak to that aspect of things. Um, you know, I, so I'm a different generation, right? So I'm 53. So, completely different generation, not a millennial at all. And um, it, what that means is that I came from a kind of pessimistic generation, um, where I was a teenager in the 80s and a young adult in the 90s. Uh, pessimistic in the sense of the left and socialism and getting beyond capitalism, this kind of idea. Because uh, I was a, a kind of a Marxist from an early age. But for me, the frustration looking at the millennial generation was that they may, might have had a chance to 
really fundamentally change politics in the United States and, of course, take advantage of their freedom to do so, right? So, in other words, this is not a single-party dictatorship. It's a dual-party dictatorship, kind of, <laughs> but not even that, not, not really. There's a lot of um, space in society outside of the political realm or outside of the state realm to do things. Um, but that, that was uh, kind of given up in favor of, you know, a, a kind of policy-oriented Democratic Party politics. Um, and, you know, things like Medicare for All or the Bernie Sanders campaign and this kind of thing. And then, of course, when Trump was elected, that was used as an excuse for people because they thought that they were fighting against, like, fascism and, and, and whatnot, which, of course, is completely untrue. Um, and so there's a great deal of space and freedom here that people are not taking advantage of. So for me, the moment, you know, for my students, because I started teaching, like, 20 years ago, my students, that generation, that first you know, my first students when I was first teaching, they had a chance to start something new, and instead they did not, right? So there is a question of, um, yes, freedom, but to do what, right? And it did resolve in a certain way that I think is unfortunate because now I think that that's where the pessimism comes from. Mm -hmm. I think that there was a sense of possibility. I think that the, the gen there was a generation raised in a kind of more prosperous era. I came up in the 70s and 80s, which were pretty rough. I think people who were uh, born and young in the 90s and you know had a different sense of optimism, and uh, that's been abandoned because it got sort of ensnared in the way that capitalist politics usually goes, and that gives an artificial sense of impossibility, I mm -hmm. think. Mm -hmm. Right, uh, so that would be my little take on that, is that yes, there, freedom in the sense of there's like political freedom and civil liberties and social freedom that people are not utilizing, actually. Um, I think Sean on the Zoom side has had his hand raised for a while. So, Sean, if you're still there, is thanks for Church? waiting. Yeah, Mark okay, Church is okay. Sean, yeah. Um, you can go ahead and ask your question <laughs> if you're there at the camera. He gave up. <laughs> I'm here. Can you hear me? Yes, yeah. we can. Cool. Uh, I was just wondering how each of you, uh, it's kind of in lieu of the previous round of questions, was like, I was kind of curious how each of you would like, feel the question of, uh, is the working class still like the revolutionary subject? If so, why or why not? Um, I'm curious how like each of your answers might differ, so anyone who wants to take it, uh, feel free. Feel free. There's a devilish light in Nance's eyes. <laughs> it's you the twinkle of Jui's son, so we're gonna make him go. Oh, you want him to go last? He knows what he's gonna say. I know what I'm gonna say. Then you go need to. I don't know what I'm gonna say. Then you should go first. Then you should go first. <laughs> my yeah, my 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 genuine answer is I don't know, and I think something that I the reason why I was so upset not ever having had the chance to like read theory and like read hard texts and engage with the history and the philosophy and the theories because. I don't know where, like personally, I, I'm still trying to figure that out. And so for me, like organizations like Theory Underground or Platypus, or organizations that are engaging with texts and making it ex accessible to all people of the working class, of college students, of the PMC, um, I think that is where something's going to start. And that's my very limited answer as of right now. We'll let, I don't know who. Yeah, I'll just say that kind of, kind of tying into what you're saying about how we are free. Um, we don't feel free because we know that we have to keep on working or we're going to end up homeless. We know that we have to keep on working and that to keep on working, we ought not to speak about certain things. Discursive Taylorism tells us to stay in our lane. And so when you're being told to major, or yeah, when you decide what you're gonna major on, you're deciding on your lane. And if you don't major on something at the university, then your lane is to shut the fuck up and get back to work and just subscribe to the correct influencer or thought leader or worldview salesman. And so um, freedom, doesn't f it, it, we are free. I can say fuck Donald Trump, fuck Joe Biden, fuck God, burn it all down, I don't give a shit. No one's gonna go, oh my God, you said that? Go, you put him in prison. 
Like, no one's going to do that there to me. There are things you can't say, though. There, there are things I cannot say. say. It's true. There are things I cannot say. Like right. what? I thought everything is like... She's saying, like, what? Like well, uh, if I were to say a woman is a biological thing, that a woman is defined by a relation to a womb, well, okay, if I actually held that position, if I actually asserted that position, obviously it's not going to go well for me turf. nowadays. I'm a turf. I'd be called a turf. That's the same thing as a Nazi. Nazis obviously need to be stopped at all costs. So obviously this is an example of what you cannot say, but there's also a lot of this on the right as well. Yeah. And so I, I'll let uh, Chris and Nance uh, address this in their own ways, the, the actual limits on freedom. But, but what I basically wanted to say is, look, not only do people feel like they can't say certain things without undermining their career uh, possibilities or whatever, it goes deeper than that. And uh, bringing it back to time energy, there's a piece in there, or there's a section in there called time energy fragility, all right? And it's the idea that what Robin DiAngelo is talking about when she is talking about white fragility is a misdiagnosed situation and it's actually time energy fragility when you are in the workplace and you're being told that you have to believe something but you have not been given a proper introduction to the field and you don't have the time energy to actually work through the constituent contradictions of the subject matter to know who said what and when who advanced whatever ideas and definitions of certain words you're just being told this is the correct view you're gonna feel like oh Okay, sure, I'll nod my head along because I want to keep my job. But if you have a sense of intellectual integrity, that's going to crush your soul. If you have a sense of intellectual integrity, you go, no, I would need longer to actually figure out what I believe. And you would have to actually educate me, not just come in here and tell me what's what. Right? Um, and so I think a lot of people feel time, energy, fragility when it comes to everything. Right? But there's just, this is what political correctness is kind of scratching the surface of. I'm being told what to say, I know what I'm supposed to say, but I don't have the time and energy to actually get to the bottom of it for myself to actually be an adult. I'm being treated like a child even though I'm in my 30s. That's the issue. Um, and so, really quick point of order, we've got, uh, how long here, Darius? We, I started a timer, we've got five more minutes, so here, here you guys go. <laughs> All right, so I would say it's not a matter of the working class being the revolutionary subject. The working class would have to become the revolutionary subject. Right? And the reason for that is largely negative, which is to say that no other group of people, if we were to put it that way, is actually capable of overcoming capitalism. In other words, if the billionaires all got together in Davos and said, you know, communism would be better, they wouldn't actually be able to implement it. Similarly, if all the PMCs got together and said, you know what, let's do socialism, they wouldn't be able to do it either. So only the working class can overcome wage labor because the global economy being as it is, as long as there are people desperate enough to be willing to be exploited to survive, capitalism is going to continue. So only the working class could collectively put an end to that situation through solidarity. So, unless the working class does it, we're not going to get beyond capitalism. Or at least that's what I think as a Marxist. Right? So, it would be a lot simpler if all we had to do was convince the rich people <laughs> to give us communism. But guess what? Even if we did, they can't do it. They can't actually do it. And that's a hard one for us to actually grapple with because we instinctively believe they're in control, they have all the power they could change things if they want. Actually, they're not in a position to change this. They're not. Yeah, I, I think similarly, no, no, the, the working class is not um, <clears throat> currently, and, and there would be a phase of becoming. I also think um, automation and the fact that when we talk about working class here in the heart of empire, do we talk about African children working in mines? Do we talk about th you know third world children working? Do we? mean that or do we mean American truck drivers and American factory workers? Um, I'm less convinced uh, about workers organizing. I, I think soon it'll be um, nothing but, but robots and um, what we would comfortably recognize as slaves. Um, and I, I just think uh, 
we have a lot more thinking to do before we can really satisfactorily answer that question. Yeah, we basically have to close out here. If someone's just dying to ask their questions, do it now or forever hold your peace. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Do we have any <laughs> so this might be a difficult one to answer with the limited time, so I apologize. Uh, That's okay. So I'm the resident troll here, sorry. Um, so, Chris, I've this question is directed at you, but anybody on the panel can answer this. So, um, you know, I've seen on previous podcasts you've mentioned that um, you believe that stepping towards the welfare state is a stepping away from socialism, not stepping uh, towards towards socialism. And so I kind of, I'm, I had some more detailed thoughts, but for the sake of time, I just mm. wanted to get your more detailed view on what that looks Why like concretely. Uh -huh. Right, because for example, like something I think about, I'm a member of a group called Class Unity. Uh -huh. um, and so, Something I think about. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I'm holding up your propaganda from the last event. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, Daniel. Yeah, Daniel Tut. Good job, DC. Yeah. Um, like, for example, you know, Medicare for All is like a universalist program that mm -hmm. is uh, less of a, um, I don't know, like a piecemeal kind of program that you might expect from like welfare in the 80s, for example. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, that's basically my question. Cool. Go for it. Go for it. Thank you. Oh, All right, so just uh, kind of very straightforwardly. The question is whether the working class should be the object or the subject of politics. The welfare state makes the working class an object, not a subject. So it's not about being opposed to the welfare state, um, but rather realizing that the welfare state is not in any way about empowering the working class. Now, you could imagine that it is. In other words, you could say, um, you know, my, my old mentor, Adolf Reed, has this perspective um, that uh, essentially increasing public benefits, increasing the public sector of the economy puts the workers objectively in a more favorable position to struggle. So essentially his perspective, Adolf's perspective, my, my old friend and mentor, for the last 40 years, has been to defend the welfare state against neoliberalism. I think we've spent too much time doing that. In other words, it was plausible as a, as a I don't know, a, uh, a backstop measure, right? There was a recognition that the working class was gonna be undermined in its social position with the neoliberal turn and the destruction of the welfare state, although the welfare state is alive and well. It's not destroyed by any means. Um, so that's the one thing that I would say. The second thing that I would say is that we're actually far more likely to get something like universal health care in the United States from the Republicans than from the Democrats. And the reason for that is the Republicans will do it as a cost-cutting cost cutting measure for capitalism. So if you remember Trump, he said it's outrageous that the United States doesn't have public health care the way all of our competing, uh, competitor countries do because it makes cap American capitalism less competitive, right? That's how it will happen. The Democrats, on the other hand, will tell us, oh, we're gonna give you a bigger welfare state, and they'll never deliver it, <laughs> right? In other words, they'll hold us hostage to it, much more likely to get it from the conservatives than from the progressives. And the struggle for socialism has to be independent of that. Right? It can't be a fight the right, stop the right kind of orientation. It can't be um, be the tail end, be the supporters, be the lapdogs, be the, you know, the voting base of the progressives. It can't be that. I don't think. Um, so I look for my example to the old, old socialist movement, which was opposed to both populism and progressivism. It was opposed to both of those things. It charted a, a course independent of the capitalist parties and of these reform efforts within capitalist politics. And even in a country that was like a forerunner of the welfare state, um, Germany, they would vote against all welfare provisions in the Reichstag. They would 
and they would do it in such a way where they would show to the working class that they weren't opposed to these benefits, but they were opposed to the conditions under which those benefits were being given. So they'd add amendments, they'd try to add amendments to the, the government welfare spending uh, provisions that, the, that could never pass the Reichstag because the other parties would not vote for them in order to show, well, see, they want to give us these benefits, but only under conditions that disempower the working class and turn us into objects of the state rather than subjects, et cetera. We have to rediscover the wisdom of that. We really do. Um, so that, that's my kind of, you know, I, I don't know if that's fully elaborate, but that's at least a couple of initial determinations to, to establish my reasoning. It would have to be sort of followed through further, but that's my basic point. All right. Uh, the event here might be over, but the conversation is never over. Um, we are going to, as quickly as we can, migrate outside. I will have books for sale. We can keep chatting out there. Dave and Nans have this cleanup stuff nailed down, so just give them 10 minutes of a long time and they'll be ready to come socialize, talk, ask, answer any more questions. So we'll see you either outside or at the bar down the street. Ask checker. Ask checker. Ask checker. Ask checker. 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 Yeah. Thank you for joining us online, on Zoom, on the YouTubes. Holly, Elton, Sean, we love you. We'll see you all later. Take care. Bye-bye. Thank you. I'm gonna get you didn't say YouTubes. I think she said YouTube. I'm hip. That's like I'm internet. <laughs> I'm cool and hip. I don't say that. <laughs>